We are talking with Ken Klein, the author of The Unforgettable Tree. You can go to KenKleinProductions.net and find out what Ken is up to. These days, you're working on some films. You already were in Israel just a little while ago. Give us an update what's going on with Ken Klein. Well, I've uh, started a new uh, section to my Ken Klein University off my website, which is a weekly, it's going to probably be bi-weekly now, or twice a week, uh, teachings that I do. It's about 10 minutes of teaching that I do. It's very meaty and good stuff, and people can follow those teachings. We've got about nine posted on a, a section called Get Out of the Boat. Uh, which is a is a kind of a teaching where Peter got out of the boat and walked with the Lord Jesus on the water, and it's it's a, it's a courageous step he took in in uh, getting out of. And the way I apply it is to traditionalism. You know, when people don't like leaving tradition and dogma. They they just are afraid to, to trust God for the supernatural. Mm. And, and so it's a teaching on this whole getting out of the boat and things that I share that I've seen. Uh, that are not necessarily what you would consider orthodoxy, although it comes right from the Bible. So that's the new thing on my website, and it's been going on for about a month. So if people go to Ken Klein University, no, excuse me, KenKleinProductions.net, uh, it doesn't cost anything. You can sign on, and if you want to get out of it, you can sign off. But what it does when you sign on, it, it alerts you to, the YouTube alerts you to when I posted a new teaching. So it's a good deal. That's, That's totally awesome. Yeah, yeah, it is cool. And if anybody's listening, and uh, I've told this to people in the past that want to be preachers and can't afford to go to the seminary, there's a site called thirdmill.org, and it is as boring as being in the seminary. And if you take some of those classes, it'll give you a good uh, basic skill sets, and you can move on from there. And then check out what Ken, Ken Klein is doing. Uh, I was checking out some of the... Uh, traffic that I see in my alerts. I set up my Google alerts, and this is an article that's going around right now. Biblical bombshell as archaeologists discover origins of David and Goliath battle. Before I get your comment on this, I am amazed at how many times I will see these type of stories where archaeologists, and it's always in the headline, confirm that King David lived or found the site where such and such happened. And I think to myself, you know, that is really insulting to get to the point where we, we read the Bible, we know the stories, we know that there's veritas in the stories, we know that sometimes it's a figurative type of thing, but for the most part, you know, it, it, it what happened is what it's written about, right? You know, parables are a little bit different. You have to extrapolate and try to figure out the meaning or the various meanings. But the actual stories themselves, these characters, Solomon, King David, these are actually people that existed. And I don't know about you, Ken Klein, but I get sort of insulted when, oh, now we finally have proof based on science and archaeology. Well, you know, uh, people on Earth are vexed with the problem of not understanding the heavens. And so basically their whole orientation to uh, form their ideas comes from their physical senses that are connected to the outer world. And so they don't understand faith. They don't understand the idea that things exist in the spiritual realm first, and things on earth are just a shadow. I mean, this is what the book of Hebrews talks about uh, when it talks about the Sabbath, when it talks about festivals, when it talks about even the temple. These are shadows. They're not the reality. And so people have to build their faith based upon the shadow world, which is what this world is. It's a shadow world. It's not the real world. The real world is the heavens and the heaven above the heavens. And this is a whole dimension of faith that people don't understand. And, and so basically, uh, you know, archaeology is hard facts. And so they look, oh, we can substantiate these things from hard facts. Well, the people of faith can substantiate them through the administration of the Holy Spirit that becomes a ghost in us. The, the white shadow of God is the Holy Ghost in us. And that's enough for me, because I've experienced the powers of the age to come without having to have it proved to me from archaeological discoveries. And, and that's the difference between a natural man and a spiritual man. So the natural man uh, has to have things authenticated to him by the physical world to mm -hmm. to validate his faith. And people of faith 
are blessed by what they don't see rather than what they do see. Amen and to that. What, yeah. Yeah. So that's the problem. And I can see why you're insulted because, uh, but, you know, it shouldn't insult you. It should just be more and more of the same. I mean, this is the world we live in, which is basically a, 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 a prison. And and uh, not only are we in a prison of our, uh, of this world, but we're chained in this world. The Book of Jude teaches about uh, the the chains, and those chains are emotions and our physical senses that blind us to faith. That's why Jesus said, when He returns, will the Son of Man find faith? And the answer is, eh, that's a good question, <laughs> wow. because it's a kind of a rhetorical question there, you know, and the question. I want for certain, I can only answer for me, I don't know for everybody else, but I certainly want to have faith by exercising it in my daily relationship with the Lord. And and one of the things I appreciate from you, Zach, is your love for communion, and that's really touched me. And, and in fact, I went out and got my own communion cups, and now I'm receiving communion more, uh, uh, as it says in the Scripture, do this often in remembrance of me, because you do show forth the Lord's death. I think it's really important. Uh, to, to recognize that repentance isn't just the initial accepting of Jesus, but there's many things that we need to repent of, even after we're saved. That's right. In Christ. I, I, I have, I'm dealing with something right now that is, uh, uh, in fact, I had a dream last night. Where God visits me in dreams through his angels, and, and the Lord, it was an alarming dream. It was troublesome. Dream. I woke up depressed. My, and, what was the dream? And, well, it, it had to do with, uh, it had to do with um, uh, me being impulsive and doing things out of a reaction and impulse rather mm. than waiting on the Lord for what He's trying to tell me about stuff. And I can see it in myself, and I go, and I don't like that about me, and I can see it in me, and I've got to get healed of this. in my It's in my soul, and that affects my spiritual life, and I've got to repent of this because I want to grow. So the Lord warned me about being impulsive and becoming more detailed orientated rather than just... Uh, focusing on the big picture all the time. I've got to deal with all of these things that he's concerned with. Be careful for nothing, it says in the Scriptures, but by everything through prayer and thanksgiving, uh, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, hearts and minds. It talks about heart being spirit and mind being soul. So there's this re ongoing repentance that we have to have, and I think as we understand the daily call to recognize that we have to take up our cross. And of course, you know I, how I feel about the cross. I don't have a problem with being of the people wearing crosses, but really Jesus was killed on the tree. That's a whole other story. But anyway, the point of it is there's many repentances uh, that, we, that we're called to recognize that we need to turn from. And for me, it's this uh, tendency to be negligent of details and being uh, sloppy. You know, I don't want to be sloppy. I want to be sharp. So that was a good thing. It was a good dream. It was troublesome, but it was a good troublesome. Mm -hmm. And 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 so um, that that's uh, currently in my own relationship with the Lord. He, he's dealing with me about that issue. Well, well, we know love is patient. That's one thing. And patience is a virtue, as the old expression goes. So I would suggest spending, if if I was in your shoes or anybody that's having these problems with impulse control, whatever they might be, or rushing to judgment or responding uh, as opposed to reacting or reacting as, a, suppose, as opposed to responding is to spend more time in Proverbs as well as the Psalms. The, the, the Bible has the medicine for the soul that we can read this, this prescription on a daily basis, and it's all what we put into it. Same thing goes with prayer life. And then the other thing that I find very helpful is what's called the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's based on the encounter of Bartimaeus as Jesus is going up towards, uh, towards Jer uh, he's going from Jericho up towards Jerusalem. So that's where the Jesus prayer comes from. And every once in a while, you'll hear that repeated, have mercy on me, a sinner, or Lord God, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of Adam, have mercy on me. All of these different phrases, have mercy on me. And it really, the original language is Jesus, God, love me. This mercy is love me. So something to contemplate. Yeah, that's good work. Um, we talked about this planet being a prison, and yeah. I've, heard it, right. I've heard it referred to as prison planet. You might have been listening to Alex Jones over the year, prison planet. It's a good way of, uh, I guess, qualifying what, what kind of world we live on. Who is the jailer? 
on this prison planet? Well, the jailer is the prince of the power of the air uh, that that uh, afflicts us and keeps us in chains and keeps us locked up in solitary sometime, and that's Lucifer, who is now called Satan. He's the jailer, uh, and he's he is the one that afflicts us. But it has to be understood that uh, any affliction that he uh, uh, applies to us is only allowed from heaven. Jesus said to Pilate, uh, he said that Pilate said, don't you know I can have you killed? And Jesus said, well, you couldn't do nothing to me unless it was granted to you uh, from heaven. So these things that we go through in this life are afflictions, but they're really the stripes that Jesus bore, in a sense. Uh, The afflictions that he took in his body the stripes, the sacred stripes, are allowed. They are they're allowed upon us uh, to afflict us, so that we would look up to God and 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 ask for deliverance and development and healing. Like I was afflicted last night in my dream. Like, but it was a good affliction. It was like it was it hurt me to have that dream. And these are stripes that are necessary. This is the discipline of God, and no discipline seems. Uh, you know, uh, pleasant, but it yields it yields something of righteousness when we turn to the Lord for help. So that's a good prayer that you mentioned on the road to Deme- uh, uh from uh, um, Jericho to to Jerusalem. In fact, I write about that in the book, uh, the the unforgettable tree is the last week of Jesus' life, and it's really interesting. And you see there that uh, when Jesus goes into the city, Jerusalem, to the temple. On the, on the donkey, uh, and they're laying palm leaves in his pathway. Uh, the pathway that God wants us to walk on is, is palm leaves, and palm leaves are represented inside the temple in, in, I think it's in Chronicles or King, and it talks about palms, trees on the walls of the, of the Holy of Holies, preceded by cherubim, palm, palm trees, and then flowers. These are on the walls of the Holy of Holies because most likely the palm tree was the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. And and so his way is is, is uh, paved with palm leaves for the people saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to the king. And then the Sanhedrin said, be quiet, don't say this. And he said, well, the rocks would cry out if they didn't do this. Huh. And, and, he, and he did that to, to enrage the Sanhedrin so that they would kill him. He maneuvered his way into... Uh, his his crucifixion by enraging the religious people of the day to accomplish God's will, and, and it's really fascinating how how th- this all worked out. Because it says if the rulers of this age would have known what they were doing, <laughs> they would have never crucified the Lord of Glory. So Palm Sunday was actually uh, Jesus laying a trap for them so that they'd kill him, which is like the wisdom of God. So. That story is a great story, and yet we kind of have an idea of Palm Sunday as, you know, Easter bunnies and all that. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it is ridiculous. The Easter bunny, out of all things, has really confused me. I know it's uh, from pagan <laughs> the pagan world, but I just shake my head. That's why in the Orthodox Church, they don't refer to it as Easter. They refer to it as Pascha, just so you know. Yeah. there's no we, yeah, don't, well, we don't use the term Easter. We use it Pascha. Well, I don't even have a problem with, you know, oh, the I fact that they, I, yeah, they, I, they call it Easter. I'm yeah. just saying that the re- the reality behind it was the Lord uh, using, knowing how they would react if mm-hmm. he's being glorified, that they'd have a counter-reaction to kill him. That's when they decided, we got to kill this guy, he's just too dangerous. And here's he's going to over... He's going to overthrow Judaism if we don't stop this. Right, and so, here's, the, here's the lesson in all of that, is that a lot of people, the Pharisees and Sadducees, at the time, and Paul later on, they thought that they were doing God's will by uh, what they did. So when he's up on the, the cross or on the tree, as you put it, he goes, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that's, you know, true to this day. When we commit sins or when we do things, whether they're good or bad, we really have no idea uh, or cognizant. We're not cognizant of what we are doing. We don't really know. It's It's... Uh, the effects that we have on people around us and on nature, we have no idea of the ripple, whether good or bad. And that's why the Lord's Prayer is really interesting. Our Father, which art in the heavens, by the way, the heavens, right? <laughs> not heaven. Uh, uh, our heavenly Father, 
is is I am in the heavens. But there's an I am in the heaven above the heavens. There's two I am's. That's why the name Jehovah means I am and I am. And so there's there's the heavens that is our initial first step in our destiny to go into into space, to go into the heavens and the many mansions which are galaxies, I think. And then after that, uh, after that mission is accomplished in, in establishing the heavens according to Isaiah 61 or 51, 51, I think it's 51 or could be 61. But anyway, have not I called you that I might plant the heavens, uh, and our Father which art in the heavens, uh, pray this way, our Father which art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in the heavens. So when we begin to develop a, a view, in fact, Isaiah goes on and says, uh, look up in the sky, now look down on the earth. We begin to develop a heavenly uh, view of things. Uh, our whole our whole walk changes, because we never look at the world the same again. We're never fashioning our concepts of the world like the uh, archaeologists are trying to use mm. the physical things to develop our our thinking. We see things in the spirit not in the flesh, not, and Paul, you know, when he's dealing with the Corinthian church, you know, and, and he's left now and the people are left behind and, 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 and they're backsliding because instead of walking by faith, they're following men. Mm-hmm. And, and he says, what are you doing? You're following Apollos and Peter and, and even Paul. I, don't follow me, follow my faith, he said. So he rebukes them and says, you look at things outwardly. And so the whole concept for reality is an outward look, and that's pretty much where the people of the world are at. They look outwardly. Well, and part of my part of my impulse is okay. I'm sorry. Well, no, it's okay. Let, let's go to uh, two Corinthians chapter twelve, and this is very interesting because it talks about the heavens, and then you can comment on that, and you can probably finish what your thought was before I give this scripture because this is what we're referring to. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of a such one, I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. What is Paul talking about in that scripture? Well, you know, Zach, you have an amazing capacity to ask 15 questions in one question. (laughs) I mean, that's a scripture that's so uh, powerful. Uh, what part of it are you asking? The third heaven or the fact that he's not boasting in himself? Uh, Paul boasted in himself, but the things that he boasted about was his infirmities. He said, most gladly will I boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me, because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So he recognized that in himself there's no good thing, that we find that in Romans 7. But he's saying to them, Look, man, I have all these visions, but I'm not boasting in that. I'm boasting in the fact that I'm infirm. And, and, and that is, and he said, I was in the deep for three days, five days. I was whipped this many times. He's boasted in his, he's boasting in his sufferings. And that going, wow, that's an amazing thing to boast about. Most people boast about how, how they're scholars or they're doctors or yeah. they've, they've saved, uh, I just saw something on with some famous evangelist. I've saved 120 million people. I'm going, oh brother, you know, this is not, this is not the spirit of the Lord. This is the flesh. This is not God. This is man. That's, Paul would never boast like that. He would just boast that, like, you know, why am I still hated if I'm if I if I'm not preaching the cross? I mean, he was preaching that which was an offense to the world, an offense to the Jews, and, and so he was persecuted for that. So persecution is a greater sign of somebody being a servant of the Lord than somebody having great wealth or or, or, or even being prosperous in ministry. I mean, I, I see it on TV. The, the, this, this church is 30,000 people. I'm going, so what? What if the guy's preaching heresy? You know, big deal. People love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. That's not a sign of anything. 
Oh, and they like to have they like to have their ears tickled with false doctrines that make make it seem like I can be covered in the blood of Christ. There's no work on my part. Grace is sufficient, or I've been saved. This, this kind of linguistics is really dangerous for the body and soul and the spirit well, of the individual. As, as far as the visions that he saw, I kind of feel like, and I don't know. I'm saying this is my subjective understanding is that. What he saw was then later revealed through John, was the book of Revelation. I think he saw all that stuff, but he couldn't talk about it right then. The people couldn't have received it. It would have been a waste of time to try to talk to him about anything. And and so I, it's not lawful. Well, there came a point where it was written down. And I think yeah. John, John in 90 or whenever it was, Apollo died before the destruction of the temple, which was in 70. He probably died in, the, you know, like 65 or 64 A.D., uh, but uh, but later, you now here's this guy, John, that is given this incredible revelation, revelations. Of, but John didn't receive that in one sitting. You know, he, he knew how to get back to the Lord's Day, which is every day. Uh, every day is the Sabbath day of God. Uh, when you hear his voice, it, that's the Sabbath day. It's not a physical day. If people keep a physical day, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that it says in Romans, some keep a specific day, some treat every day as Sabbath day. And I tend to treat every day as a Sabbath day because it's yeah. about me hearing the voice of God. That's so right. Yeah. There's no condemnation for people go to church on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Go well, ahead and go. Let, let me but just, every day, let, yeah, every let, day is, and John knew how to get there, and he got many revelations. Let me just say something about that. Um, just because you go to church every Sunday, does not make you uh, a child of God, nor does it save you. It's the attitude and the proper mindset and this faith that you have in Christ and acknowledging Christ as your Lord and Savior. And also, uh, you know, there's this, we, we fall into this trap. We show up on Sundays and we feel really good about ourselves, but it's really for naught if the rest of the time during the week, you're falling back into all kinds of sinful ways and being nasty to people and not helping others and not listening and not loving people. So if you're not doing all of those things during the rest of the week, don't come to church on Sunday and think that makes it makes up for all your rudeness the rest of the time. It just doesn't work that way. Like that commercial. It's not how any of this stuff works. You become a new creation in Christ. And you're right. Every day is the Lord's day. And every day you wake up is a mini resurrection. Yeah. And I think the the problem is that we don't understand, and this gets back to the archaeologist, I'm glad you started the messages off today with that view, is that we don't realize that we live in a shadow world. And and that shadow world was set up by Jesus when we find that the war in heaven necessitated there had to be a whole creation being subjected to vanity. So we live in a world mm. of vanity, and, and the van, which means a temporary time or an emptiness where, where, where the presence of God was recused from this world. And we can only find the presence of God through faith. We cannot find it necessarily in a church congregation or anywhere. It has to, we're the temple of God now. Jesus defined the temple of God as destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. And for that, he was treated as a, a blasphemer, because the, tap, the temple was sacrosanct to the Jews. That's where God's presence was. So how can you say something like this? You'll destroy something that took 50 years to build. And by the way, it's a centerpiece of our religion, so kill this guy. That's why he was considered a blasphemer. Well, was I, redefined, redefining the temple as us. It was, also, him it was also the center. Us. It was also the center of their economy. This, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and when Jesus went to the temple... He went to the outer court. The outer court is where the doves were being sold and the money changers were, and all that commerce was taking place, and he was angry. And he was angry. He said, you turned my father's house into a den of thieves, and he overthrew the, temp- the, the tables there and was pretty upset and whipped people. And that took place, which is interesting, uh, in the outer court. It was, took place in the outer court, and that outer court is talked about in Revelation 11 when it says uh, uh, John's receiving some information after he sees the seven thunders. I don't know if we talked about that. No, we didn't get to that yet. uh, But before we go any further, let's uh, bring it back to The Unforgettable Tree, written by Ken Klein. You can get it. It's available on kenkleinproductions.net. 
There's also the university, Ken Klein University. I guess that's what you're calling it. Yeah. Okay. So you can sign up for that. It's for free. Well, um, no. Let me just clarify a little bit. If you go to KenKleinProductions.net, right? Okay. KenKleinProductions.net is is where you go to see all my work. But also at the bottom of the landing page, when you see my books and films and all that, there's a place to sign up for the YouTube. Uh, uh, Biweekly uh-huh. okay, gotcha. uh, information. So do you, when you go there, you got to sign up, and and then you'll get notified by YouTube. They'll tell you actually when I do a new posting, and mm-hmm. those postings are the teachings that I bring, so that you, if you're interested in following along, you you can you can always opt out if you sign up. There's no cost; it's just free. But you have to uh, sign up to get the uh, alerts from YouTube. Got you. All right. So let's uh, get to this point. I want to talk a little bit about chapter 17. So we're leading up to what ends up being the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. He's taking on the temple system. He runs out, the, he takes a fashions a whip and runs him out of the temple, the money changers. And right. there's a lot of stuff going on there. I mean, they're making it a den in iniquity. They're cheating the very people that they're supposed to serve. He's infuriated. It's righteous anger, drives him out. He's making statements, as you said before, as he's riding in on the donkey on what's called Palm Sunday, that really infuriates him, which causes a mindset of madness. So take us right right. to the mindset of madness that's happening at this time. Well, try to imagine uh, these people whose authority and power uh, was so vast and so fearful uh, that when somebody was healed of blindness, the parents were afraid to tell everybody how this person was healed, and, and they they were afraid of the Jews. That's a good insight into uh, the power of these the Sanhedrin, which are the Pharisees and Sadducees, had over all the people because of the law of God, which is a, the, the Tanakh, or the Ten Commandments, and, and the book of Leviticus, and all that in the Ezekiel. So the power of Judaism and its far-reaching effect uh, was comp- comprehensive. It was everywhere. It's ubiquitous in the land. And so when the Pharisees and the Sadducees decided to go up and, and deal with Jesus up in Galilee, this is the early stages of his ministry, they had to walk almost 100 miles to deal with this guy, Jesus, who's turning the world upside down up in Galilee. And he just didn't wince. He just rebuked them. He said, you guys are a bunch of vipers. I mean, he didn't cut slack. I mean, he dealt with them straight up. And you can imagine the disciples when He's dealing with these people that are the most powerful people in the land, and he's turning them away, and they can't even argue with him. He's too powerful. They're blown away by this guy, Jesus. And so, uh, of course, he's the Son of God, and he knew what he was talking about. They didn't, uh, in terms of, you know, spirituality. So the Judaism and the elders that claim to have, you know, a firm grasp on the law were very powerful. So... Uh, when this guy's coming into the temple throwing things over, they go, what authority do you have to do this? Kyle? This is our t- this is our temple, not your... What are you doing here? And he's trying to set things straight concerning the, the purpose of the temple as a house of prayer. Well, now when he reduces it to himself and says, no, that really doesn't reduce it to himself. He re- re-identifies the temple as, as himself in whom dwells the Spirit of God, and now the Spirit of God is given to his people on the day of Pentecost without measure, he's explaining to us what the real temple is, and it's not a place. And that's why he says, you know, to the woman at the well, uh, where you, you Jews say, well, it's in Jerusalem, but where's the right place? He says, those that worship me will worship in spirit and in truth. So it's everywhere. Everywhere you stop and, and, and contemplate God and worship Him and thank Him for whatever, you're the temple of God now if you've received the Holy Spirit and without measure. So He's changing the whole world, and for this, you know, He was killed on a tree. Why? Because the tree was killed on was a fig tree. And the fig tree was in the Garden of Eden, and it was most likely the tree, and I think it was, that Adam and Eve ate from, and they covered themselves with fig leaves. So the fig tree was what he was killed on, and when he cursed it, he was cursing the law. He was cursing the law, which was, the fig tree was a metaphor of that. Yeah, and may nothing grow on you again. So in other words, he... he, Because the the law cannot produce righteousness. Right, and and at the same time, he's also saying something uh, about the Pharisees and Sadducees in the ruling class that may nothing grow from you again. He's shutting them down at that point. That's right. 
And so finally, you know, in 70 AD, uh, the temple's destroyed. So there's no, when I was in Jerusalem, you know, a month ago, there was this New York Jewish guy that got, I allowed to get in my cab. He said, can we share the cab with you? I said, sure, come on. And, he, and, and I said, isn't that the tomb of David? And then the, the wife of this guy starts to say, no, that's not it. Where are you from? Who are you? And she starts querying me like, what are you? And I said, well, I'm I'm Jewish guy that believes, it, believes in a different covenant than you do. And that started a big war huh. with me. And, 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 and I said, why are you guys arguing with me? You know, you, you have no way to fulfill Yom Kippur, and yet you're arguing with me that uh, I, I don't know what I'm talking about. But how do you keep Yom Kippur? Well, we don't have to keep it, you know. Uh, I said, how do you do it without a temple? How do you do this without a temple? And they said, well, we don't have to do it that way anymore because all we have to do is pray and fast on Yom Kippur. And I said, well, that's not what the law says. The law says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And like, so you guys are changing the law, but the law doesn't change. You know, heaven and earth may pass away, but my law will never. So you guys can't even keep your own religion, and yet you're arguing with me that I'm some apostate Jew. I'm saying you guys are, uh, you guys are disgusting to me because you argue for something that's against what the Messiah is all about, because he shed his blood so that you don't have to keep Yom Kippur anymore. You keep it through his blood. So, wow, man, you can't believe the fight we had. And the wow. guy was shook his head at me, but 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 he Jesus redefined the temple. We're it. We're the temple. Well, we are the temple. We've been having the same fight for three to five thousand years now. I don't know how long it's been, but it it seems like you know it, it's underlying these fights in the Bible are underlying in the New Testament. You mentioned the parents who were afraid that they were going to get kicked out of their temple because yeah. kicked out of the synagogue because their son who was blind from birth was cured by Jesus Christ, Jesus That's the right. Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. And what I love about that story, and a lot of people miss the sense of humor, or they miss the exuberance that some of these people who find Christ have, where the son goes, I already told you this. What, you want to believe too? And I laugh at that thing. I'm like, what, you'd like to believe too? You want to follow him too? And it only makes them matter. So out of the yeah. mouths of babes really is, is so true. And the wisdom that's contained in the Bible I like when Jesus goes, well, there's no deceit in that guy over there. I mean, that's a funny line. There, there is a sense of humor that Jesus has in a very um, cerebral way. So if yeah. you're a person who says, well, I'm all about wisdom, well, you'll find it in the Bible. And the, the struggle that we have as Christians is we, ha and especially in the West, is we have to take our, our faith in Christ from our mind and reason and put it where it belongs, where the law is written in our hearts. And that's, that really takes a leap of faith, because it's counterintuitive. Just like the message of the cross is foolishness to the Greeks, and a, a, a curse to the Jew, right? That's yeah, how, the, how, the, how the Scripture goes. This is a that's very, right. very exciting thing. Uh, um, as we um, talk about the subject, the unforgettable tree, and you can go to Ken Klein Productions and sign up for the newsletters and take part in the university and buy the books and the films. A lot of great things. Um, a lot of people have been talking about the sign of the times. And we talked about this last week. And we're running out of time, but let's just try to get there if we can. That okay. the leaves are turning green. And we're seeing what we consider the end times. A lot of things are lining up. Now, it might be tomorrow. It might be next week. It might be uh, 10 years from now. Could be a hundred, could be a thousand, because one thousand years is a day to God. It really doesn't matter. But there's the sign of the times, and a lot of people are starting. And I, I see this pop up on my Facebook. This Antichrist figure. Who is the Antichrist figure, and how does he play? What well, is really amazing? He plays into salvation. Who is the Antichrist figure? Do you know who this person is at this point? Do you have any ideas I, I, who it might be? I have suspicions, but I'm not going to say because it's totally speculative on my part, and I don't like to go there in speculations about things like this. I can tell you this, though, that the one of the signs, two of the signs, one I talk about in, in my film uh, or in my book, uh, The Deep State Prophecy in the Last Trump, and in the new film that I just produced that... Uh, it's going, I just I retitled it to the video um, extension of my book, the same title, The 
it's coming out soon again uh, with a new title. But it was uh, on my website. It's called The Four Horsemen of the Endgame. Uh, I talk about one of the great last signs, which is the eighth head of the beast system. And that is, to me, uh, pretty clearly uh, manifested. I don't like to jump to what I'm going to say because there, it wouldn't be credible just to jump to the conclusion. So let me just say this. Unless you read my book or watch my film, uh, you're going to have a, it would be a stretch and a jump in your logic. So I don't want to do that. But one of the last signs is the eighth head that comes out of the seven of the B system that spans the panorama of, of time since the Egyptian empire. So this is, all, this is a, a bird's eye view of history and it cons- cons- consolidates and ends with this eighth head coming out of the seven heads of the beast. That's happening right now. And we can see it. So that's one of the signs. But one of the other signs is called the, uh, um, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel standing where it ought not to be. Now, this is an amazing sign that has not been understood and, and talked about in eschatological circles by evangelicals or Pentecostals or any of the high churches. Uh, know or can comprehend the meaning of this, but the abomination of desolation is something that Jesus talked about in the book of Matthew, something that you talked about last time we were on the air, uh, and it's really important to get into that. I, when I come back next time, uh, um, a week, you know, when we when we do our show again, uh, I'd like to get into this sign of, of the abomination of desolation and put it into a time context that you mentioned that a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, because unless you understand that he's the Alpha and the Omega, the coming and the going, he sees everything all at once, you wouldn't be able to understand the abomination of desolation as a sign, but it's, 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 it's upon us. It's really upon us, and it has to do with this third temple that the Jews want to build on the Temple Mount, which is really called the Haram but they, the Jews call it the Temple Mount. That's not where the Temple was built. It was built over the city of David. That's another film I did, Jerusalem Lost Temple of the Jews. So you've got to understand all of these pieces to the puzzle to, to get an a objective, bird's-eye view of the meaning of the abomination of desolation. That's, what I think, uh, the very one of the very last signs uh, before the coming of Christ. I don't think he can come very soon, personally, because there's too many things that have to fall into place before he returns. Is the Antichrist alive now? I, I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I, I suspect he very well could be. I would think that uh, that one of the places to watch for it uh, is uh, the head of the United Nations, whoever becomes head of the United Nations, uh, after I think Trump is president, uh, very well could be uh, the the Antichrist. But I don't know, and I don't know when the I don't know if Trump's the last president. I don't think Donald Trump is the Antichrist, uh, but, you know, I'm very suspicious of who is over the United Nations. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, all the nations of the world will be gathered uh, against, and it talks about uh, the two uh, witnesses that prophesy uh, in Jerusalem, uh, and they're in the outer court of the temple when they prophesy. And they're hated by all the nations. All the world hates them, uh, and they're killed by the beast. Uh, it says their, their bodies are, are laid there for three and a half days. They won't even bury them because they want to show the world that they were victorious over these two pr- two prophets. Yes, but you'll and know they, these prophets because they won't be able to kill them for a while, I think, maybe three years, I think. Three and a half years and they'll half years. prophesy. And I think what they'll prophesy over, Zach, is that the temple is not the temple of God that the Jews want to build, it's not. Uh, it's an abomination to God to build a temple hmm. because it, it, it negates what Jesus said about the true temple. Uh, absolutely, is. yeah. There, there's after the death and resurrection of Christ. There's no need for the temple. He basically, uh, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, tossed that simple uh, that that system aside. No more animal sacrifices. So I think the abomination would be a return to animal sacrifices. Well, it's it's not only that. And I don't know how much time we have because I don't want to jump over the line here and and uh, kind of get ahead of what I'd like to share in more detail next time. But the two prophets will be hated by the whole world. Okay. And they, the beast system is the whole world. 
and it's because they're saying something, I think, against the temple. All right, and, we'll, 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 we'll hold it off. Ahead. We'll hold it off right there. It, it's okay. something against the temple. So the next time we get together, we'll talk about the desolation and abomination uh, that you speak of. And we'll also explore more topics that can be found in the Unforgettable Tree, which is available at KenKleinProductions.com, along with no, all no, the other no, books. no, 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 dot net. I keep I keep doing that by accident. No, you know well, something. I, I I that's okay. the first time I've said dot com as opposed to dot net. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> it's a, it's a net because somebody stole my dot com, and and, and you know because I I, I, may, I well, somehow forgot to re-register it, so oh. I stole it because there's so much traffic. Oh, that's but not it's nice. A, it's a dot net. Well, you know what it is. It is what it is. We live in a fallen world, right? There's yeah. these. So it's a dot net. Can't climb productions dot net. Okay, great. And um, I think that's just about it. Until next time, Ken. Um, God bless. Have safe uh, travels, and we'll speak to you soon. Okay.